Mod Zero here with a vlog review of Battle Angel Alita slash Battle Angel, depending on which title you're watching it in and what chunk of the world. This is a live-action film adaptation of the manga, um, which I've previously reviewed in prose form blog, on, blog, on my blog, blog at CountZeroOR.com. Now, the track record for live-action anime, mixed, one of my earliest reviews on this show, I'm breaking it all down, was a review of the live-action Giver. Not great. It's the first film. I still haven't seen Giver Dark Hero. Um, and it's like, for every good live-action anime film we've gotten, like the live-action Blood the Last Vampire, which... Probably haven't seen, and I really should do a video review of um, for the channel. Get like five bad, bad live action anime. You get a, a Dragon Ball Revol Evolution, or a live action Fist of the North Star, or a Giver, or a G Savior. Um, so, I could see for a lot of people expectations being mixed. So on the one hand, the track record for live action anime is low. On the other hand, James Cameron has attached to this project for forever. And not because it just, oh, he signed a contract and didn't even heard anything. It's he bought the rights himself and this is a labor of love for him. So... Oh, and Cameron has a well-established track record. Yes, there is significant crap that you can say about the story of Avatar. But it's a gorgeously directed movie. And the acting performances are excellent, even if the material that's presented is mediocre. And, like, Cameron's... His track record is solid. And then... When Cameron was basically kind of had to hand off the reins to actual di actually directing the film because of having to do Avatar 2, he picked Robert Rodriguez, who also has a very solid track record. And Rodriguez basically is directing the largest budget film that he's ever done in his career. Um, even his like relatively seeming bigger budget films due to cast or what have you, like Sin City. Or um, his chunk of Grindhouse, or what have you, and Spy Kids are relatively lower budget, like, like are, are not as big budget as other comparable films. Rodriguez is a director who can get more with less, and so the question is, what happens when you just back the money truck under? up to Robert Rodriguez's house. Because he operates a studio house more. Not entirely. He's also shooting plenty of stuff on location. That sort of stuff. You know what I mean. Um, and the answer is, you get a really, really visually stunning, well-acted, well-directed, and well-written movie. Now, I'm going to say up front right here, trying to minimize spoilers, that this film covers the first two volumes of the manga. You picked up the first omnibus of the manga from the library, or from Barnes & Noble, or from Amazon Kindle, you definitely will know what you're getting into. It doesn't really go much too much beyond that. And that's all save for, for the, the narrative scope of the film. But it covers a lot, and it's away from the manga in a few different directions related to various stuff. Um, but it sticks a lot with the look and feel of the manga. You have these beautifully freakishly look freakish looking cyborgs in this movie. And while we have nobody who truly goes so far as in the manga, or presumably the presumably I'm adaptation, I haven't seen the OVA, taking myself over that because they edit 
Morricon, dealer, the dealer's room, and I passed it up. Anyway, dress is get is like you have these freakishly massive cyborg grotesque cyborgs along with these walking alongside normal looking humans and we have this really well built world and what makes this film so great is Re Robert Rodriguez takes it a step further um one of the complaints I get and I, 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 I see when it comes to depictions of science fiction earth or other science fiction worlds is you'll see people of color as prominent foreground characters, but you don't necessarily see a ethnic diversity in the background. And Robert Rodriguez, as a director, is definitely a person who is definitely paying attention to that. This is a very ethnically diverse world. Um, Blade Runner, we got a bit of that. We had less Asian faces, but we had an increased African presence and a Russian presence. A little bit Latino. Um, but here we have Black. Latin. There's Asian ethnicities. Like, the only thing I think we're missing is, is um, Pacific Islander, uh, Samoan, Maori, Maori, Hawaiian, that ethnic family. And I admit I'm may have overlooked some characters who fit that. Um, and I'm, I'm impressed by this. Lots of signage in the movie is bilingual, um, Spanish and English. It's, it's really impressive. And I, I, I dig that Rodriguez took the extra mile. Because this is the kind of thing where I'm like, I mean, yeah, probably, like, I mean, films are a work of thousands of individuals. But that they've got that line of text at the end of the credits. I think it's like a stock thing now, or to make it clear. But yeah, this is a movie that thousands of individuals make. But this is definitely a point where I could, I feel like Rodriguez is like, hey, we're casting extras. Don't just get white people. Get lots of people of different, of different ethnicities. And the set designers, hey, don't just put the signs in English. Put them in other languages. And probably also check the languages as well. Oh, Check the translations and make sure that they fit. Um, that's that, that is pretty awesome. Um, this is definitely a film that is building up to larger, to more things. Like it's not wrapping here, but honestly, Battle Angel Alita manga. There's never really. Like, I'm. I, I've read the whole first manga, and I'm starting Last Order. And I've yet to reach a point where I'm like, okay, this is a stopping place. Like, a straight-up cut. Everything's tied up, aside from a few points. We can move on. Stopping place. Maybe at the end of the Motorball arc, but that's a lot of material to cover in one film. You, you do a... Uh, six-hour miniseries, okay, or four-hour miniseries, or what have you, okay, sure. Um, you can fit that much stuff there, because there is, because the Motorball arc is basically a sports film all by itself, and we start leading into that, we are introduced to Motorball, we get some Motorball sequences here, and they're wonderfully done, but we're not Alita's not in the grand championship match, really, into this. I will just say this up front. Like we're, we're, we're leading up to, like, it's clear the next film is Motorball Arc. Like, the full Motorball Arc, or something similar. And we have motivations for why um, set up in this, this movie. If you read the manga, you know what that means. If you haven't read the manga, that's okay. Don't spoil it in the comments. If you do, I will... Delete your spoilerific comments. Wait a couple months. Wait till it's out on home video until you drop that stuff. Um, home video slash Netflix. Wait till it's on Netflix before you drop that stuff. Or other similar streaming services, but moving on. Um, so, 
this film is like it, solid as a rock. I am impressed by how really good this is, and it appears to be doing well at the box offices. Going from the reports from Variety, it's did great for Valentine's Day weekend. It's leading fairly well, um, possibly beating out uh, the Lego two, Lego Movie two. So I am honestly pleased by how well this movie turned out. It is a film which gets the manga in a lot of respects in terms of the story and the tone of the story in terms of how Alita is written um, as a character who begins as an innocent and while she loses her sense of innocence she does not lose her sense of justice and idealism and that's kind of a fundamental part of her core that is carried throughout the series this is this film set makes it clear that that is who this person is and it's intrinsic to her nature and I dig that. And I like... like again, all the little bits and touches that are from the manga that they didn't have to do, did. As a great example, one of the, hunt, one of the hunter killers, um, Zapan. In the manga, he's got the blue oyster called upside down question mark on his head because Kushiro, the creator of the manga, is a giant Blue Oyster Cult fan. Recurring character Desdi Nova is a reference to not just a Blue Oyster Cult album, but a relatively obscure Blue Oyster Cult album that kind of tanked. So, we've got that, and, we're, we're, and we, we preserve that with the character design for Japan. It's not called attention to, it's not like painted in big neon paint on Zapon's forehead, but it's there. They consistently make sure to put it there so that if you're looking for it, like, hey, that the Blue Oyster Cult logo on his forehead? Yeah, it's there. Um, as far as the points of whitewashing go, again, much, the manga is set, the, the, the scrapyard, slash, they call it here, uh, Iron City, is set in, or located in approximately Kansas City, Missouri. Later in the manga, we get a map and we get the full geography of where everything is. And the yeah, Iron City is about in Kansas City, Missouri. And it kind of fits with the, and with what we see of the city and the location around the city, it kind of fits. Um, sort of, we don't have any, really any sign of the river, but we've also had a major war that may have changed geography. Uh, so that bit to it, uh, and it, it also means that we have a cat that we have room for a cast that is both very ethnically diverse, and also gives you room to stick more recognizable faces in the film without taking away from other major roles, um, or, 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 without, without turning generally Asian characters into not, with the one distinct exception of Ido. Uh, Dr. Ido in the manga is Japanese, his name is Daisuke Ido, and they change him here to Dr. Dyson Ido, who's played by, name just fell out of my head, uh, the guy from Unglorious Back Bastards. Um, Christoph Waltz, who is honestly very, very good in the role. I've in Gorgeous Bastards, he is fantastic and sinister and just wonderfully evil there. And here he's... He fits the role of Ido perfectly as a very paternal figure. He fits for Alita's surrogate father figure over the course of this arc. Because the, this arc is, in a way, Alita's childhood. So, did you see this film? Yes, absolutely. See it in the theaters? I saw this in IMAX and 3D, and it definitely benefits from both, especially 3D. Rodriguez works 3D well into the film, and to an extent, he's worked with 3D before with the Spy Kids films, and he put any trial counts did it fairly well there. I later Spy Kids films on theaters, so I can't speak to that. But by all accounts, Rodriguez gets 3D, so. He has a good eye for it, and he's a good person to handle it here. 
him and Cameron are probably the two directors who get 3D the best when it comes to cinema. I don't know if this is a post-conversion or not, but it works. So, that's my thoughts on the film. Next week will be next episode of Nintendo Power Perspectives, and the week following will be sliding back into anime-related territory with a review of the next Legend of the Galactic Heroes novel. It'll be somewhat vloggish this time, because there's not as much backstory to cover this Catch you later. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.